everybody for the comments on the last video. I am gonna take everyone's advice and there's only one person that dissented that um, this should really be oil and not grease and I, I'm in agreement. So you may remember that if you've been watching the channel for a long time, it's a little tool I made and I figured I would never use it again, but here we go, need it again. So let's get this thing disassembled. Oh, well. One thing I need to do is bend that pin back down or that lock washer back down. Okay, that one's not broken off. Unlike the one on the lathe inside the headstock. with the most gentle tool possible first. And if we need to, we'll go with something more. Oh, wow. That's not how I figured that was assembled. Hmm. It's probably not a, not an easy replacement right there. Yeah, it's got the little brass plugs on the bottom to uh, keep the uh, set screws from just destroying those threads. Forgot about this set screw down here. Let's see if that makes our life easier. This is kind of a cartridge and you can kind of take it all out at once maybe. Set screw on the other side as well. Oh, it is. Nice. Glad I thought of that before I started messing around. So, Everybody still on board with no grease? It's like this is supposed to be in here and then through that passage into the bearings. Yeah, that's all one part too. That would be a pricey fix to make a new one of those terms of time or buying one would be very expensive. I think it's still got plenty of life left though. It's a little bit of wear on the teeth, but not, not to the point that I don't uh, want to put it back in. All right, let's give this a shot just to see where his stuff goes. Oh, well. That immediately squirts out there and also goes comes through the, the central bearing here. Now that we've got all the parts and pieces disassembled, cleaned up, and uh, ready to go back in, I want to get the rest of the grease out of this thing. What we'll start with is trying some air. If we can, get most of the chunks out this way, and then when we start flushing it with oil, it won't be quite as big of a mess. That's my hope anyway. Ooh. Yeah. I wasn't pushing in hard enough, but yeah, it's getting, getting grease out. Let's see if I can do this with one paper towel. There we go.
So I don't love making gigantic messes, but for the sake of a video, that was pretty fun. There's a reason I like to use this chip shield for uh, more than just protecting me from chips. Nice big old glob of grease headed right for you guys. All right, we'll do a little bit more blowing and then I'll show you how we are going to flush it out with the oil we're gonna be using from now on. Obviously oil can get congealed and get nasty as well, but I think this is why, um, one of the reasons anyway, why grease isn't a great idea. Stuff got, some of it got trapped in there and the fresher grease kind of squeezed around it apparently. But uh, once I get my 175 PSI hose on there, um, all kinds of nasty stuff comes out. So I've got this thing pretty well cleaned out. I went ahead and shot some brake clean in there as well to uh, try and flush out as much of the, the old nasty stuff as possible. And it's, it's you know, probably good enough just to put in use as is, but um, I've got it apart. Why don't we get all of the stuff out of there? Uh, to do that, it's very common for people just to take an old grease gun or go to Harbor Freight and get a cheapo grease gun and weld up holes or whatever and put new seals on there to try and keep it from leaking and just turn a grease gun into an oil gun. Um, I opted to go for the real deal. Uh, I plan on having this lathe for many, many, many years and I figured I may as well get something that's designed to not leak. And even though it's expensive, buy once, cry once kind of thing. So this is an Alamite 4035 made in USA. So what we're gonna put in this is good old Mobile Vactrid number two. Got partial bottle here and then I uh, bought another brand new bottle because I knew I'd be doing this. Oh, shoot. <laughs> well, that's way more than I need. Oh man, stupid Aaron. No! Wasting my precious Vectra. Ah, bummer. Okay, let's get this done before I make an even bigger mess. All right, there we go, let's set up. Let me clean that up and put the Zerk fittings back on and then we'll try it. So we'll use that to kind of catch some of this oil. Put that guy on there. Put my safety squint covers on. And I think this thing says you get an ounce per seven pumps of the lever. Ooh, yummy. Most of that's just air bubbles though. First, it looked like it was nasty stuff. Let's give it a little blast shield. Of course, it's coming out of the uh, the bore here and then down here in this bore as well, which is good. That's where we want oil coming out of, all of those places. That's better. Looks like whey oil now, doesn't it? I think we're good. I think we're ready to go back together. This is everything and it's all cleaned up to get us back to kind of where the compound came off of the machine anyway.
Before we get going on machining the cross slide, I wanted to show some goodies that I got yesterday. Found a little bit of a, a picking spot and ended up with some things that I've wanted for a long time. So that guy there is a do more tool post grinder. Number 44 model 8006-210. That's a smaller model, but I think that'll actually be perfect because my compound is so tall I can't you know, I don't think there'd be enough room to really get a, a appropriately sized one for a 10 horsepower lathe in there. So I kind of had to buy everything at once. I ended up with some stuff that I totally cannot use. This is a, a South Bend milling attachment and it's complete in the box and it's pretty much in perfect condition. You can still see scrape marks and stuff on the cross slide or on the ways of the, the, the mechanism. So. That guy's gonna go on eBay and earn me some of my money back. Uh, this is a More Tools air-powered slot grinding jig. Yeah, there we go. Kind of a mouthful. But anyway, this is for use on a uh, jig borer from More Tools. I got a couple of mallet faces. Um, these are South Bend size three collets. I don't know exactly know what they what they call them. I don't think they're three C, are they? Maybe that's all that is is. Uh, 3C, but anyway, that's like 16th to a half. And there's some triangle inserts, this pretty cool Craftsman 90 degree head for sticking on a drill and you can put a sanding pad on there. So that's kind of neat. Uh, big old hunk of high speed steel. I don't know what that was used for. Uh, I've got some cemented carbide sticks. Don't know exactly what these would be used for, but I'm sure there's a good use. Somebody will tell me in the comments. And in the context of all this other stuff, can anybody give me a suggestion what this fixture might have been used for? So those two pins going in those blocks, screws down to something. Locating pin maybe there for that side. So if you have a guess for me, please share it. And then uh, what I think is probably the coolest find is two sets of more tools setup blocks. So these are stack up blocks, kind of like how Robin Renzetti uh, makes his one, two, three blocks. So these are factory made that way. I'm, I'm guessing that's where Robin uh, originally got the idea. Maybe he said so. But um, anyway, you can fit socket cap head screws down in, in, in these guys and stack them up to your heart's content. So very, very cool. Those were expensive when they were new and on eBay they go for crazy money. I'm pretty surprised by just, just how valuable those are. But um, anyway, there's two sets. This set is not nearly as clean. It's got a lot of surface pitting. They're still on dimension. I uh, did some measuring and they all seem perfect in that regard, but they're, the surface is just not beautiful and lapped anymore. So those, those were exposed to some moisture at some point, unfortunately. Really don't know the best way to set this up. So we're just gonna experiment, see what happens, see what works, what doesn't. Um, I do wanna have it up and um, the cutting side on the front of the table just to make filming a little easier and show you guys what I'm doing a little bit better. This is the, the near side to the camera is what we're gonna cut. The side with the stop or uh, lock, whatever you want to call it, is on the non-cutting side. So we'll put those big guys down and the top of the cross slide is machined parallel to the underneath the underneath side, the underside. Um, and yeah, that's what we're gonna hope go with, whatever. So if we do something like that and just set this guy down where those are broadly across the uh, the base where the compound rotates. Should we just put it directly on the table? It's probably smarter, isn't it? All right, fine. Let's just put it directly on the table. And then we just overhang on this side. 
And then we can just clamp to our heart's content as far as pressure on the center part. Yeah, that'll be fine. I think we're all squared away here. So I've got everything clamped down, uh, tuning fork across the middle and then toe clamps on either side or uh, two clamps on either side. And then to indicate it, the side we're cutting on is actually the gib side. So we don't have a straight surface there to go off of. So what I've got here is a mold leader pin. Um, this is uh, ground and polished. It's not like ridiculously accurate, but it is pretty accurate. And I think for our purposes, it's way good enough. So I've got that in there. There's a, a tiny step on it. So we're right at the edge of the, where the step goes. And from there, I think we've got like eight inches. So. I think you guys are hopefully still able to see that. So anyway, we're, this is a half, ten, half thousandth indicator and we're basically about a half, half a thousandth off, which is, you know, not bad. Obviously I could spend a bunch more time getting it closer, but I don't think it would have a practical effect. So there's the setup, it's the idea. And then be able to hang the end mill over the table and not cut the table which is important. And again, we're just gonna go for majority cleanup. If there's still hollows or um, even if there's still some paint left, that's totally okay. We're just going for, you know, a, a almost all the way cleaned up. And then um, we can mount our mounting bar to this, yeah. Got a half inch four flute carbide end mill. And I'm not sure exactly where the highest spot is. Maybe it's more towards the middle here to give us a touch off spot. Oops. Yeah, just about 100%. Looks pretty good.
Looks pretty good. I know I had to shuffle around some material. So I can't remember exactly what is what. But I think that's my bar. So obviously the reed head is going to be mounted on a bracket on that thing. And then this guy will be on here like such, approximately. So the next thing I need to decide is where exactly I want to put my mounting holes for putting this bar in place. And I also got to decide how much clearance to give there. Got some decisions to be made. So once that is done, I've got my holes tapped in here and I, I'm probably just going to do two. I don't see any reason to really go crazy on this mounting block because it's not I don't know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do three holes. One, two, three, kind of a evenly spaced out. That'll give it way more strength than it'll ever need, but nothing ever built too strong. Nothing built too strong ever broke. Is that how it goes? That's a fairly heavy angle iron to mount onto the mounting bar. So it'll be cut off on one side and then I'll just use some screws to mount it into the hardened and ground bar. But that will prevent any damage from the tailstock coming in this way. Um, I'll probably make a provision for a foot to come out underneath where the uh, reed head is mounted and that'll po provide a positive stop <clears throat> where the, the tailstock makes contact with the carriage first. And this is just um, backup insurance and debris protection. So aluminum would be fine, but I like working with steel.